and writer, CEO of Cryptix, Age. Um, he will be sharing his insights and expertise on cybersecurity today. And I don't really want to take up his time because we are here for you, Armin. The floor is yours. Yes. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So, hello, everyone. It's really great to be here at this great conference and to have this masterclass. And um, let me at first quickly introduce what we at Cryptix do. So Cryptix is a venture building company. And in the last few years, we established a few ventures in the web free and blockchain space. We act here as a one-stop shop, so if you have any blockchain projects, we can deliver full service, which means that we do marketing, we take care of legal topics, we do software development, product development, and IT and IT security. So in the last year, we, for example, built Blocktrade. Blocktrade is a cryptocurrency exchange. We built eCredits. eCredits is a layer one blockchain solution for merchants, for shopping. We also have ambassador programs and so on. And we also use it for tokenization projects. Then we have Ekito. Ekito is a MiFi 2 licensed broker in Slovenia, where we do crowdfunding projects and um, financial services in general. And finally, one of the last ventures that we did is uh, Rock Solid Estate. It's a real estate tokenization project where we have um, a few apartments in Vienna. We will tokenize them. We will do a crowdfunding via Ekito. The investors will get a security token on the eCredits platform. And in the next month, they will already receive payouts from their investments. We all do this because we want to create wealth. And uh, we have such an infinity loop which starts on the eCredit side. So you go shopping, you get some kickback, and you can save this kickback. You can then use this kickback to invest into real projects, like in the real estate project. You will then get payouts, like dividends or, or rental income, and you can use this again to go shopping. And the good thing and the nice thing here is you will get it on the next month, and you will get it to your e-wallet. So you will wake up, you will have a notification, and you know that the money is coming in. We are founded 2017. We are about 60 people at Cryptix. But if we look at our whole ecosystem, then we are about 200 people working there. Our main locations are here in Zug in Austria and in Slovenia, and we already created eight ventures, including Ekito, Rock Solid Estate, and the Cryptic Security. We then split our services into three areas. So one is business and consult, uh, IT and consulting, where we do, for example, uh, cybersecurity, software development, blockchain research, blockchain consulting. We have a marketing and communications area, and we have a financial services area. And below that, through all the services, we build our ventures and we do business development. So here you can see an overview of all the services that we provide, starting with tokenization, software development, blockchain research, cybersecurity, marketing, and many other things. So let's now start to talk about why we are here. So let's talk about crypto security. And at first, I would like to ask you, so who of you feels secure in the crypto space and with your funds? So basically, just three people. So, <laughs> so you're in the right room here, so that's good. And um, let's start to talk about what happened last year. So we had a lot of crypto breaches. Uh, security gets more and more important. And uh, last year, we saw, for example, about 3.8 billion drained from web free protocols. So it's a quite lucrative business to be in there. We have about 200 million um, lost due to exit scams. We have about um, um, 355 million lost because of flash loan. Um, manipulations and exploits, and we have about 1.3 billion lost because of bridge exploits. But it's not just about crypto security, what we talk here, it's in general cyber security. And uh, we also had a Twitter breach last year where about 6 million users were affected. NVIDIA lost about one terabyte of data 
Revolut had a data breach, also WhatsApp, and we all can remember the Log4Shell, this big issue that affected basically, yeah, I would say nearly all companies. And finally, we had the last pass hack, and I would like to talk a bit about what happened there, because it's really interesting to see how they were able to get in there and what happened. So, in August, LastPass stated um, that they detected an unauthorized access. They said it's still fine. Um, in September, they said that no customer data or passwords are compromised, so it's still secure. In November, and here you can see how it step-by-step step evolves. So, in November, they notified the customers about another security incident, and then they confirmed the theft of source codes and technical documentation. So that's already a huge issue, because in, in source code you sometimes have uh, uh, secrets, maybe they are encrypted, maybe not. Um, the attackers will know what libraries do you use, so they can really start to, to attack the system. In January, um, the CEO said that an attacker was able to exfiltrate an encrypted backup of the vault. This is an issue, it's not that bad because it's encrypted, right? So you, can, you need a key to decrypt it, so basically it would be secure. But in February, they said that a DevOps engineer was hacked, and as part of that, the, the attacker was able to get a decryption key. And that's a huge issue. So they still said it's fine because we have our zero knowledge architecture. So if we look at this picture, we can see that you have a master password, and they will put the, the, the master password into a password based key derivation function. Until May, they did 100,000 rounds, so to make it hard to brute force it, and um, now they increased it to 600,000 rounds, which makes it a bit more secure. But it's also important to mention that in earlier years, they just had 5,000 rounds. And some people didn't migrate or change that, so they are still at this like old security. So out of this password-based key derivation function, they um, get an encryption key, and this encryption key is used to encrypt and decrypt the data. They use the advanced uh, encryption standard. As we know, it's a symmetric encryption, so they use the same key for encryption and decryption, and um, it's a quite secure um, um, encryption mechanism, and uh, that's basically how you get the data. In addition, they store the encrypted vault on their servers, so by sure they need to have it there so that they can provide the service, and they have no access to it. And um, all these vaults of the users they are by sure also backupped. And um, this attacker got access to these backups. And um, let's see how this, this evolved here. So we already know the attacker has access to the encrypted vaults. Basically, with that, um, he can't do that much. But the attacker found out that there are four DevOps engineers who have this decryption key. Because they previously, we know that they hacked the source code and the technical documentation, and most probably they found the information there. So then they started to attack those DevOps engineer, and they found that one of them had an outdated media server running at home. So he didn't update the, it was the Plex media server for about three years, and there were a few vulnerabilities already found in third-party libraries that are used in this media server. So, by doing that, the attacker was then able to install a keylogger and capture the keystrokes of this DevOps engineer. And um, one part that the, the, the attacker was able to get was the master password of the corporate vault of this DevOps engineer. So, the attacker had basically access to the, to the password vault of the DevOps engineer, which included the decryption key for the, um, for the backups. So the, attack, the attacker took that and is then now able to access it. What LastPass then said is that um, the attacker was able to copy a backup of customer vault data from the encrypted storage container. This container contains both unencrypted data, such as website URLs, and fully encrypted data, such as passwords. So the thing here is, they still say 
they have their zero knowledge architecture, and that's why it is secure. But let's think a bit about what this means. So they have access to all the vaults to, of all the users. So they exactly know who are the users that use LastPass, and they can already um, try to brute force um, the vaults of the high net worth individuals, of VIP persons. So they can really target specific people. In addition to that, there is unencrypted data such as website URLs. So they know that the user is, for example, using Facebook, that the user is registered as a bank, or that the user uses whatever other service. So that's very useful because you can start to do very targeted phishing campaigns. You already know a lot of, the, of, of those users. And in addition to that, if they store such website URLs, so sometimes there is some session information included, some link for a reset password, so you can, the, the attacker can use that to get access. It's also that they write such as. So what does such as mean? There is also other data that is leaked. And um, you will find a support article where they describe in detail what is included there, so what was breached. And um, one field in there is, for example, if the password for this website was generated by LastPass or created by the user itself. So that's also very useful if you want to target some specific websites and try um, some, some passwords that you know from previous um, um, hacks. So it would be good if that would already be the, the whole thing. So, I mean, we have this encrypted data, and um, that one is still secure. But we need to assume that it is secure that they use a strong master password. So they state that their um, um, requirements are 12 characters, and it must be mixed up. And in that case, it takes a few million years to crack it. But who of the users really uses a super random password? So that doesn't happen that often, to be honest. And um, that opens a, a huge issue. The next thing is they have this backup. So even if they are not able to crack it now, maybe they are able to do this in five years. And if you, for example, store your seed phrase in there, and they are able to hack it in about five years, and they drain your funds, then you basically lose everything. So <laughs> that was a very, very interesting um, thing, and we can learn a lot out of that. So, I just wrote down a few things here. So the first is, be sure, keep your software up to date. It was in the home office, and um, the home office is a very interesting and good thing for the red teamers, because usually people don't update their routers at home, you don't have logging, so you don't know what is going on, you don't have uh, mobile device security and such things, so that's already a, a, a huge issue. So that's why you should really limit the access to your information um, and only allow compliant devices. What's also important is, I mean, users are lazy and you always have this like trade-off between security and usability. And um, users, they, even they have the VPN, the company VPN, they sometimes tend to just turn it off to surf in the internet because it's maybe faster. So that's another huge issue. And um, I mean, it's somehow understandable, but what's really strange in this whole thing is that this DevOps engineer was able to access really highly sensitive data. So that should really not be possible. So make sure to, to restrict the access and think about how it is possible to access this data and where and how you store it. So what does all of that have to do with crypto security? So crypto security is not just hot and cold wallets. So if you talk to crypto people, they sometimes just say, OK, you need to have your offline seed phrase, and then all is good. But the topic is much more complicated. And um, let's at first have a quick look at what is a hot and cold wallet. So a hot wallet is basically connected to the internet. It is therefore less secure. You will use it for small amounts and for a daily use. So this is, for example, your mobile app. 
A cold wallet is something that is offline, so it's not connected to the internet, and therefore it's also much more secure and much difficult uh, to hack. You can have, for example, a paper wallet, you can have a hardware wallet to store your amounts there, and usually you then just transfer from the cold wallet to the hot wallet, and then use the hot wallet. So, I now have a few questions here. So, just think about if you have crypto, um, what happens if, for example, an exchange gets hacked? Do you have lots of funds there? Then it's probably a huge issue. What happens if someone hacks your PC? What happens if a password manager is hacked? I mean, we just saw that this is possible. What happens if someone threatens you? So if someone visits you with a gun and says, hey, give me your money. But it's not just about that. It's also if the government comes and um, wants to have your, wants to know how much crypto you have and so on. What happens if your house burns down? And what happens if your hardware wallet firmware update is manipulated? So, there are a few things you can do. We all know not your keys, not your coin. So, just transfer away the stuff from the exchange to mitigate this risk. What if your PC gets hacked? You can say, okay, let's use a hardware wallet. What if a password manager gets hacked? Yeah, then you use something like an offline or cold wallet and you make sure that you don't put your seed phrase into the password manager. If someone threatens you, there is something uh, called a hidden wallet. So, um, some hardware wallets offer this option where you, you basically unlock it and you have your wallet. And um, in this unlocking process, you enter a passphrase, and if you enter another passphrase, then you come to your hidden wallet. So even if someone comes to you and says, hey, give me your crypto money, please unlock your hardware wallet, you do this with your main wallet, where you just have a few hundred bucks, and um, the other millions you store in your hidden wallet. In case your house burns down, you can have multiple hardware wallets, for example, and you can spread them, or you can have a paper wallet where you have the seed phrase stored in the bank, for example. And um, yeah, if your hardware wallet or firmware update is manipulated, you can be sure on the one side split funds or use a multi-seek wallet. The multi-seek wallet is, by the way, the one option that helps you in basically all of these cases. So, many people now think, okay, how high is the chance that um, a firmware update is manipulated? So, I found a few examples on the internet, and um, there are people who said, okay, I updated my Ledger Live, and it asked me to enter my seed phrase. So, that's somehow now a bit suspicious, but not that much. So, they entered their seed phrase, and then all the funds were drained. Another example is someone used Windows, reinstalled Windows, so thought, okay, everything is fine, um, then installed the Electrum wallet, entered the seed phrase, and then the funds were also gone. So just because you reinstall Windows, it doesn't mean that everything is cleaned up and all the malware is removed. In general, I have to say that crypto security is a lot of traps. Why? Um, if you think about a hardware wallet, if you want to have it available basically everywhere, because it could be that you say, okay, if I fly somewhere, I still want to have some possibility to access it. Or what if you are in a country with, where you have a, let's say, a strange government, and you want to basically flee from the country. So then you want to have a backup available not at your bank and not in your house, because probably you are not able to access it. So, if you save the seed phrase, for example, in a, uh, in a password manager, or you use a PGP encrypted file for it, something like that, what could go wrong? So, you can have a malware or a virus on the PC. There could be a key locker, which um, records your keystrokes. It could be, could be that your password manager gets hacked. It could be that someone does an acoustic key locking attack, so they basically try to monitor the audio sequences when you enter something in the keyboard and try to derive the seed phrase out of that. The same is they could have a camera where they try to, to film your keyboard from the outside through the window. 
And um, there is something called side channel attacks. So they can be used for your PC, but also for your hardware wallet. And um, also firmware update, as we have seen, can be an issue. So what is a side channel attack? A side channel attack is um, you have a protocol and you don't attack the protocol itself, but something that happens beside it. So if you decrypt data, for example, then you have your source code and this takes time and power. So um, if you have more statements, then it probably takes more power and you can measure it and you can then see it and try to get the, the key out of that. Another good example here is a voltage glitching attack. So that's what a team did last year on a very popular hardware wallet. And what they basically did is they put extremely voltage into this hardware wallet and were able to switch a, a, a bit from no access to partial access. With this partial access, they were able to access the random access memory of this device. That's still not a big issue because there is not so many interesting information, especially the seed phrase is stored in the secure element. But then they initiated a firmware upgrade, and as part of the firmware upgrade, this device stores the seed phrase unencrypted in the random access memory so that they can, just in case, write it back to the secure store. And that's how they were able to hack one of the most popular hardware wallets. So even with a hardware wallet, you are not secure. So here is just a quick overview how you can protect your hardware wallet. So that's really basics. You should only buy it from the vendor. You should only use your own seed phrases that you generate. You should never enter it into a PC because it could be leaked. Use it for storage only and um, double check if the firmware updates are really legit. So we now already learned that there are side channel attacks and that the hardware wallets also have some issues. So how can you really protect your funds? The best thing here to do is uh, to use a multi-sig wallet, such as the Gnosis Safe, in combination with a hardware wallet. So a multi-sig wallet is basically a wallet where you need multiple signatures to transfer money out of it. So you can allow three people to sign a transaction, and you need two people to do it so that the transaction is possible. You can basically have all kinds of combinations here. So you can have three out of five, or you can have two out of five, whatever fits best for you. And I would like to go now through an example of a company which deals with crypto. So let's assume it's a, a company has a few thousand in crypto, and they want to store it in a secure way. So the CEO creates a hardware wallet, um, because hardware wallets are more secure and then they think they are fine. So what happens if the CEO has an accident? Then the funds are gone. So what you can do is you can create a second hardware wallet and give it to someone else. So in case the CEO has an issue, you can go to the COO who also has an access and who also has a hardware wallet. But this puts you under another risk. So what if the C COO um, somehow wants to damage you and wants to steal your funds? So that's why you start to introduce multi-signatures. You can now create a multi-sig wallet and say, OK, two out of two, there is the CEO and the COO, and they are allowed to transfer the funds away. That's even worse than the first option, because now if the CEO has an accident or the COO has an accident, you lose all your funds. So let's go for two out of three. You add your CFO as another signer. Those three people are all in the same office. So a chief comes to you with the gun and says, hey, I know you all three have the, the possibility to sign um, a transaction, so please do it and transfer your funds to me. So as a next step, you say, OK, I want to be protected against that, so let's spread across multiple locations. So we have two out of three across multiple locations. So what could still happen is that those other two people, they come together and say, OK, um, let's take the funds and let's run away. 
Then you say, okay, let's go for three out of five. So you create a paper wallet, which you put to the bank. You have your COO in one location. You have your CFO in another location. The CEO is in another location. And um, you have one wallet, which you give to one of the employees, for example. So then you are already quite safe, but we can continue to play this game and say, okay, what if three of those people are in the same airplane and the airplane crashes? Then only two keys survive, and again, you lost all your funds. So that's why you should do something like a risk assessment, where you should go exactly through all those things and think about, okay, what risks do I have? In general, if you want to secure your... your um, um, funds and stuff, then by sure use strong password, use multi-factor authentication, make sure your notebook is secure and compliant, and um, beware of phishing scams. Coming back to the risk assessment, so a risk is basically um, here in the middle of this triangle where you have an asset, the asset is your crypto for example, the threat is a phishing email, and the vulnerability is the human error. So you need to think about what assets do you have and what potential vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities and threats are there. So you just list that, you go through it, so that's not a rocket science, you just do it quite fast, think about it, and then you rate those risks, you add a value for the likelihood, so how likely is it that this happened, and then you add another value for the severity, so how, how high is the damage. If you have a lots of funds and you have just one hardware wallet, um, then maybe the chance that the house burns down is not that high, but you will lose all the funds, so the damage is extremely high. And that's how you can can rate those risks, you can act on it, and that's the basic of cybersecurity in general. Let's now dive into the topic of corporate crypto security. So for companies, you have different challenges, like multiple users need to have access to the funds, the users are often not crypto-heavy users, so what we experienced in the last years is, for example, there is a hardware wallet, and I want to hand it over, so I just give it to my colleague. But this person still knows the C-trace, right? So that doesn't work out. But that's really hard to understand for people who are not in this crypto space. You also need to make sure that um, you, you, you have procedures available if an employee leaves the company or if you have an insider threat. And you also need to think about how do you generate those keys and seed phrases and so on. And there is a thing available, it's called the cryptocurrency security standard. So that's a standard developed by the, crypto, by the cryptocurrency certification consortium. Um, there are a lot of, of prominent people also in there, and they created a standard which is an addition to the ISO standard and which focuses on crypto security. You can get an audit for your company. There are three levels, so you have a self-custody, so that's basically a shop that uses crypto and accepts it. There are qualified service providers, and there are full system, which is, for example, a custody provider or an exchange. They have various topics, so it's, for example, key seed generation, how does that work, how do you create wallets, how do you store your keys, do you document it in the right way? What happens if a key is compromised? So what are the procedures going on there? Um, and there are other things like audit logs. So that's a very important thing. Um, or security tests, penetration tests, audits. So that's all included. The standard is public available. So you can just go through the table, check it if you fulfill those things. It's a very, very good input for you if you want to increase your security. And um, if you want to get audited according to the cryptocurrency security standard, then we as cryptics, for example, can do that because my colleague Alexandre, our CISO, he is um, the first CCSS auditor in Europe. And um, yeah, we are happy to support you here. I would like to close this with um, 10 general tips for, for security. So the first is don't pull all eggs in the same basket because even if you have a breach, just one part of your crypto is, is gone. 
be especially careful with hot wallets. So we saw a few examples um, where, we, we, where users had an issue. Make sure that you always have a secure backup of your wallet. Beware of phishing scams. Double check the addresses that you have. Make sure that you don't store too much on, on one exchange. Do not share your wallet by sure. And um, finally, use this multi-sig and hardware wallet because it allows you to access it from different locations, also for you personally. So if you are like traveling around, and even if someone like breaches your hardware wallet, you still have two other options how you can access it. So thanks a lot for your attention. Um, finally, I would like to mention that we have a booth out there. So if you are interested in cryptics and encrypted security, visit us. And we also have a cybersecurity challenge where you can win 100 euros in Bitcoin and um, something in e-credits. And um, yeah, just visit us there. And yeah, thanks a lot for your attention. And um, if you have any questions, then please come up with them. Do you have a, a question or? OK. Yes, absolutely. So um, we have these multiple ventures. And what's important for us is to always include security when we build those ventures and we help them. So in the crypto space, sometimes this unfortunately doesn't happen, but we really think security in all areas. So if we build a solution, we think about how can we secure the software, how can we secure the smart contracts. We, we audit all the smart contracts that we do. And what's very important to mention here, we don't focus on the crypto part, but on having compliant devices on following an ISO standard, so following the best practices in the general cybersecurity area, because in most of the cases it's like phishing mails and such things. And um, yeah, we also have cybersecurity awareness trainings that we do with the employees, and those are quite successful. So, yeah. That, that's a very good topic. I wanted to include it, but I forgot it. So the ledger recovery is really interesting. It was, a, to be honest, a huge shit show that happened here at the backlash they got from the, from the community. Um, the issue here is they, they announced that it's possible to back up your seed phrase, so like the recovery service. And the big issue is that they, in the past, they always said, they are not able to access it. There is no way, never, also not in the future. And now they just deliver a firmware update and it works. So there is a very good reason why they, they have this like um, back backlash from the community. I mean, what must also be clear somehow is that these hardware wallet providers, um, they deliver the firmware updates. And they always have some opportunities to get your seed phrase. So they can, for example, have a firmware update. You start the ledger in that case, and it says something like, the firmware upgrade failed, so please enter your seed phrase. You enter the seed phrase, and in the source code, they could basically store it somewhere, send it somewhere. So in general, there are such possibilities. Um, but by sure, if you announce it's never possible, and then it is possible, so that's a, a huge issue. And that's why multi-sig wallet is a, a very good option, because we see all those hardware wallets are also not the, the perfect solution. Yeah. Yeah, so I will quickly repeat the question so that everyone hears it. So the, the question is how many companies are already CCSS audited and how many companies are allowed to do that? So in the last half year, we, half year to a year, we see that it gets more popular. One of the reasons is by sure the FTX 
debacle that we had, for example. And um, for example, Fireblocks is one of the companies that is already audited. So you can look on the website, you will find all those companies. And um, as I know, there are currently about three to five who are audited. Also crypto.com is working on it. And um, regarding auditors, there is also a list on the website with all certified auditors. And there are currently about 20 to 30 people in various companies across the globe. As I said, so we were the first one in Europe. I don't know if there is already someone else, but yeah. Yeah, so I don't have a recommendation here. So there are a few interesting wallets that allow that out of the box. Um, there is also a, a hardware wallet available which supports Bitcoin multi-sig wallets. So I would go into such a direction. I don't want to have any names here, but um, yeah, it's a Swiss provider. It's an interesting project. So. Thank you. Thanks. So, so little token of our appreciation. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Thanks. Uh, if, you're, if you have any questions to Armin, uh, Cryptics has a booth outside to the right, so feel free to stop by, talk to them, say hello, ask any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you.